the circulatory system under pressure. Next, on call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Valentine's Day takes center stage this time of year and our thoughts turn to attributes of the heart. Tonight we look at the effects of environment, lifestyle, and genetics on the heart's continued and proper strength and rhythm. <clears throat> we'll look at the surgical and non-surgical ways to help protect your heart and at blood vessels that feed oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the body and even to the brain. First, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. It's true or false question. When a blockage of an artery occurs, the body can repair itself by making another blood vessel to bypass the blockage. True or false? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of A Picture of Health. I wrote this book with the wonderful accompanying photographs by Dr. Judith Peterson. We'll announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show, but remember you only have 10 minutes. 10 minutes to get your answer in. We need your medical questions though, and we'll take those all uh, hour about heart disease as they are called in or they're sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send us an email. Joining us tonight from at North Central Heart and the Heart Hospital, Vera Heart Hospital in Sioux Falls are Dustin Weiss and Michael Bacharach. Thank you, doctors, for joining us. Thanks, Rick. And you're the new guy. Uh, let's tell me a little bit about yourself, Dustin. You're, you're from where originally? I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, that's where I did my high school, and then I did college at uh, North Dakota and Kansas, and then I did my medical school at University of Nebraska in Omaha. I continued there with my general surgery training, and then I would do went to Yale for vascular surgery fellowship. Oh wow, Yale! So that's that East Coast. Is it really good out there? I I enjoyed it and had a, a very good experience, and it was nice to be on the East Coast for a couple of years. But my wife and my family are very happy to be back in the Midwest. So. Yeah, and we're glad you're here. How long have you been here now? Uh, about a year and a half now. Great. So, I mean, this is a great group that you're working with, and I'm, I'm happy that you're here. And you're liking it? Yeah, very much. Very it's good. been a great experience. I have great partners, uh, very interesting cases, and um, great patients that are appreciative of their physicians, and it's fun to, fun to work with them. And what's the most common procedure that you perform? You're a surgeon. You're, you know, you're a vascular surgeon. You, do, you can crack open the heart and do bypass surgery, and you... You, but you work on vessels like yeah. Mike, but you come from a surgical base. Yeah, so I'm a vascular surgeon, so I do both open procedures with the scalpel and open, open incisions, uh, pretty much on any blood vessel other than the heart. So I do by, uh, peripheral blood vessels, but not coronaries. I also, will do, oh. I also do endovascular procedures as well, which is procedures rather than making an incision and dissecting down to the artery, it's a procedure where you actually go from within side the vessel and treat the either the blockage or the aneurysm. In that Endo way. within endovascular. Yes, exactly. Procedure. Yes. And that's yes. kind of what Mike does. But you came from uh, internal medicine, cardiology, uh, and then an interventional uh, right. history. Right. T tell that's us right. a bit about your story. You're from <laughs> where originally? Well, I, I'm actually a Wisconsin native originally, and went to uh, medical school at the University of Wisconsin, and then I trained um, in medicine and cardiology at the Mayo Clinic. And, um, and I did, after completing my cardiology fellowship, I went to the Cleveland Clinic and did a additional year in basically vascular medicine and vascular intervention. So I did these endovascular techniques. And you have to remember, that was at a time when this was all learning. very new and... Um, that was when? Um, 90, actually, 92, 91 and 92. Wow. Um, so it's been a while. Now, and, you, and right now, you're one of the teachers that travels. Right, so, so, I'm, so then I, I came here in 95. And I stayed a couple of years on staff at Cleveland and then moved here, wanted to get back to the Midwest. And so I now consider South Dakota home. I've been here 20 years, so, uh, but. Uh, so, and then you travel worldwide because you teach these kinds of things well, elsewhere. It's the, yeah, it's the advantage of getting into a technique that's new, you know, um, and there weren't many people doing it. So I've had been very fortunate. I've had an opportunity to travel a fair amount and teach. And in fact, we're, we're one, actually one of the training programs, and Dustin helps with this as well, one of the training programs for the Mayo Clinic Vascular surgery fellows actually come and spend three months with us. So I love so, that the Mayo uh, so Clinic comes sense, yeah, to you so, guys so, right. to learn how to do these so, things. So yeah, no, it's been um, um, I, I'm very fortunate in how things have uh, worked out. Right. 
Uh, we have a question from last week that came in, and I thought I might just start with that one. A 63-year-old woman from Sioux Falls has a question about peripheral artery disease. Peripheral meaning mostly legs, arms. I mean, that's the peripheral system. Uh, a friend had a new vein put in the leg, and one year later it was bad again. Then they used a vein from the arm, and the leg is still blocked. What procedures can be done for him? So let's talk about, was it a vein or was it an artery? Or did they use a vein for, for an artery? Or explain that. Yeah, it sounds like they most likely did a, a bypass. So what they would do is take the vein out of the, usually we use the vein from the same leg. Uh, if that vein is inadequate, we'll use the vein from the other leg. Or um, like the patient had their second procedure, you can actually take the veins out of the arm. You then attach that vein above where the arterial blockage is and you sew it there, and then you dissect the artery below the blockage and connect the vein there. And so then you're actually bypassing around where the, where the blockage is. So it's interesting, uh, arterial meaning you're, you're, the fl flow is from the heart out to the vessels. The veins, when you're bringing it back to the heart, mm -hmm. you take one of the veins, and they have valves, mm -hmm. so you need to make sure the valves are in the right direction. Yes, and then yeah. you and then you bypass that artery with with the vein. Yes, with the vein, and then so the vein will dilate and thicken, um, and uh, and carry the blood flow around the arterial the arterial blockage. Yeah. Yes. And the use of the vein as a native conduit for bypass works really very well. Um, there also are um, plastic type, what we think of as plastic, but they're Gore-Tex or various kinds of Dacron yeah. grafts that are also used. Um, each has its advantages. Obviously, veins normally work very well, and of course the the unfortunate thing about this situation is that, that for it to fail after one year is... Um, Bad sign. Is, uh, is, yeah, that's, uh, prognostically, that's not a good thing. I mean, uh, I mean uh, does it mean that that person had an inheritable problem? It, does it mean that the, they're, they're, they're continuing to, to block or clot or...? It certainly could be. It could be that the risk factor modification, maybe they've continued to smoke or, or perhaps that their diabetes is difficult and so that the blood vessels down below where the bypass was inserted um, just can't carry enough blood flow anymore. And unfortunately, um, as Dustin mentioned earlier, there is a group of folks, um, you know, in that 5 to 10 percent range that, that basically have such significant blockage that they do end up losing a limb. Yeah, and, and that's what does happen no matter what you do sometimes. I mean, uh, how often does that happen? I mean, you, you help them, you bypass them. Many of them do very well for a long time, yeah. but some of them don't. Um, well, it depends on you know, how, how they present. So if you have patients that come in with acute, acute limb ischemia, meaning you know, either having pain in their foot at rest or having a wound with vascular disease on it, then the amputation uh, rate is, is significantly higher than patients that just have claudication or pain when they're walking. Um, some studies have shown that it's uh, if you take all patients with acute limb ischemia, up to 40% of those patients will uh, require an amputation. Uh, 40, the other 40% will be alive with, with, with their limb. And actually, the mortality can be as high as 20% with that at six so, months. So it's, it's bad disease, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's a significant disease, and that's why it's important to uh, catch it early and to do lifestyle modifications and medical treatment as, as much as possible uh, early on. So the, mo the most important thing we can do to help uh, prevent vascular disease like this that we're talking about is, uh, is lifestyle changes. Now before we ask that question though, if I have claudication, in other words, I have, a, I have uh, a, uh, angina of the legs and I'm feeling pain when I'm walking, I stop, it goes away. What does that say about my possibility of having other vascular disease, strokes and heart attacks? Well, I mean, there, were, there have been large studies done in the past that go back a number of decades now that clearly establish that people who have blockage in the leg blood vessels have a very high risk of having blockage um, in the heart blood vessels, and probably in, it's in that 80% range. So it's very significant. It doesn't guarantee it, and there are some folks that are lucky that don't, but um, it's a very high percentage. Now, not all of them need to have something done. They may have blockage that's not critical, but um, it is a marker for of trouble. Of trouble, that's right. All right. Sometimes at the beginning of a stroke, there is a disconnect between one's thoughts and actions due to damage that's happening to the brain. My day started as a normal day. I mean, I got up, 
Um, I was going to go to work. Um, you know, so, you know, the, I have my routine, you know, shower, shave, shampoo, and uh, get ready to go and have some breakfast. And when I, when I got to the kitchen, um, things were a little confusing for me. Um, I, I got the, the oatmeal out of the cupboard, and I got the bowl out of the cupboard, and I got the spoon out of the drawer, and I couldn't figure out what to do with them. So I had these three objects in my hand, and I was froze in place. My wife came in, and um, um, at, at that point, when she came in, somehow I figured it out, and I had the bowl in front of me, and I was sitting at the table. Um, but as I was eating, the stuff was coming right out. So one of the tests I had was an MRI, and the test result showed that I had a stroke. One of the things that I remember the most is that one of the pe one of the persons who was a must have been a speech therapist, a audiologist, and she shows me this picture, and this picture is something out of Dick and Jane. I know I'm dating myself with that, but and it's a very simple picture, and I can't tell her a thing. A defining moment f uh, for myself in my recovery, the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, but especially the speech therapy, because that was the hardest for me. To my surprise, one of the first things the speech therapist does is she puts this picture in front of me and she says, can you describe what's on this picture? And I just, I get emotional about it. Because it's the same picture that just a few days, weeks ago, I was shown at the hospital and I couldn't describe a thing. And I told the speech therapist, you're gonna sit here for the next half hour because I can tell you everything that's in that picture. And I wanna put that picture in a frame because I knew I wasn't back all the way, but I was coming back, so you better watch out. Well, that's a great story. Thank you for uh, sharing your story f with us. I mean, he presented with an interesting array of symptoms. You know, uh, how common is that, and how common uh, are strokes? Well, you know, I think his presentation is actually relatively common. It became apparent as he described this that he really didn't understand what was going on. It didn't come to the forefront that he was having a stroke. He just couldn't figure out what was wrong. And I think that this is why we perhaps do need to use the name brain attack as opposed, like a heart attack, only of the brain, as opposed to the stroke that seems sort of abstract and maybe it'll resonate with people. And I think that, that more education about the kinds of symptoms that people will have. Like, like what? Well, um, they may have weakness or clumsiness in an arm or a leg. And it may be a transient, maybe a relatively uh, limited type thing. They just can't hold the coffee cup or they drop something that they wouldn't usually drop. They may develop slurred speech or word finding problems, like he couldn't describe something. It may be that you're sitting across from your wife at the breakfast table and you want her to pass something and you can't ask for it. I mean, it's, it is not always this situation where you suddenly fall down or lose motor function in an arm or a leg. You know, it can be a very subtle thing. Yes. Yeah. I think an important point is that it can be a transient. So it can, you can have these symptoms and all of a sudden you feel, feel normal again. But still, it's a, it's a major problem. It's something you need to seek medical help immediately because it's a sign that if you don't get treatment soon, you will have a, a major stroke. So that's a transient ischemic event, a, 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 an event that happened in the brain, goes away that should not mean, oh, it's better and I don't need to do anything about it. It means you need to get in. Now, what would you do? Would you say, five? Uh, let's say it's 9 o'clock at night, would you go to the emergency room or would you go in the next morning or what would you do? Well, I, we, what we advise patients, if they have a, f a, a specific neurologic deficit, meaning that they have clumsiness or they can't... Their right, right arm doesn't work. Um, or, that sort of thing, that they seek medical attention immediately. So either they go to an urgent care center or they go to the emergency department and describe their symptoms, even if they've gone, even if they've resolved. 
and, and they're no longer having active symptoms. They can undergo evaluation, um, it may be a brain scan, may not be, but it, at least, or therapy can be initiated. Maybe it was related to blood pressure that's out of control, or maybe some other things. It doesn't always mean um, that, um, that, you've, that you've had an acute permanent uh, uh, damage to the brain, but it's something that you clearly need to have evaluated. Right. I, I wouldn't wait until the next morning. You wouldn't wait till the next day. Would you take an aspirin before you go to the emergency room? <laughs> yeah. Lots the of people is, do. Right. Lots of people do. The only problem is that remember that 50% of strokes that occur that are acute are, are hemorrhagic. They involve some form of bleeding. bleeding. And as a result, aspirin may not always be of benefit to you. So I think that you're probably better off in seeking medical attention on an urgent basis and then allowing the clinician to make that determination as to whether you should be on aspirin or whether you need blood thinner or whether you, you don't need either one. So if you have a TIA, which was exactly as he described, well, it la it, but a TIA is it's gone within an hour or something like that, right? His yeah, was less than 24 hours, mm -hmm. it, yeah, technically. But uh, all right, but if you have a TIA, something that goes away, what is the percentage that you're going to have a bigger stroke, or you're going to have another stroke, or you're going to have a vascular event? Well, that's a little complicated to answer because it depends on the cause. If it's related to blockage in the neck blood vessels and you have severe blockage and you've had a TIA or small stroke that then resolved, your risk of having another major event is uh, of about 10% per year. Um, if, however, it's due to atrial fibrillation or some other type of Heart event, rhythm right, 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 yeah. then it's, it's a very it's different, different situation, yeah. Right, but then that's another diagnosis that needs to be made. That's right. And you treat that with a right. warfarin compared to aspirin for this, for example, right. or? That's correct. Uh, well, we have questions about that, but uh, anything else that we should make sure that people realize? A, a TIA, or a, a neurologic event, means get to the emergency room or get right into the clinic. So, Rick, my own mm -hmm. father had an event, and he stayed at home while my mother went to a concert. And I called him and said, what's wrong? And he said, gee, you know, my arm's not moving so good. And, um, and I said, well, Dad, you're having a stroke. And he said, no, no, I think I just slept on it wrong. I mean, that's unfortunately, and that was my own father, who huh? um, is a health professional and should have known better. But, um, and of course, he was, lived in a different city, and I had to call a friend to go get him. And, you know, it was a, but, <laughs> but I mean, but, but it was... Right, but those things. But isn't a dad right. of a doctor supposed to be smarter? Yeah, he should because be. Of it. He should <laughs> be, but uh, well, drop uh, but, it. Now, uh, here's a picture. This is, uh, I, you know, we can look at this picture or this picture. How about uh, showing me? This is a hemorrhagic. Yeah. So this was a situation which you see this uh, blood clot here. Draw, uh, drop, push hard. You see this this blood blood clot right in here that's traveled up and it's caused. Um, this is actually bleeding inside the brain, this whole area here. And so that's a situation which you would not put someone on blood so thinner. Th this is bleed, and then there's a clot in Oh, I see, yeah. So, um, so that's a situation where if you have a bleeding into the brain like this, that's not a good, you wouldn't put someone on blood thinner at that point. No. That's a, what do you do? Well, um, if, if, for example, they're on blood thinner, and, you know, for say they're on warfarin or Coumadin for some other reason, you'd stop it's it and right. correct it. You do those sorts of things. And in some cases, it's a matter of just symptomatic care. Um, if you go to that other picture. Right, this one. So this is where you have. Push hard. It's where you have plaque here that's resulted in probably a narrowing. And now this clot has occurred here. If this travels up, it will plug up an area. And then a whole area of the brain, this whole area now, there's no bleeding there, but what's happened is it's not getting enough oxygen and blood. So that area then becomes damaged, and that can result then in a major stroke event. Right. So a hot thing that happened 15 years ago was the, the, the inter, uh, immediate intervention of a heart attack by using a clot buster drug. And then later, we were talking about intervention of uh, strokes with clot buster drugs. Uh, and then there's been some arguments that we're not doing that enough because we wait too long or we don't hunt down the case or the patient doesn't come in. Could you explain that, Dustin? Well, 
Yeah, so the, the idea would be that by getting rid of the clot, you're going to reperfuse that area or get blood flow back to that area of the, the brain right, and prevent before, it, before, before it's irreversible. Um, and the general recommendations are if it's less than three hours, um, you can use systemic thrombolysis where you give a medicine that will actually dissolve the, the clot. And that's specifically if you have a embolic, atheroembolic stroke rather than a hemorrhagic stroke. Right. And there is developments now where um, uh, people are using catheters similar to heart, the cardiac will they'll go up and they'll, they'll treat the specific blood vessel with, uh, with the lysis or commonly suction out the, the area of the, the blockage. And stents? Sometimes, not necessarily the stents. Just get uh, that clot that out of Yeah, it. I'm not familiar with a lot of intracranial stenting. Stent. Yeah. Some, it's most of that's done actually for aneurysmal disease. But I think, Rick, the, the issue really becomes, there are a, a couple of points that there are challenges for us, especially here in South Dakota. One is an awareness, and as we kind of emphasize that people, when they have symptoms, they need to recognize that they need to seek medical attention. And the other thing is, you know, we're a, a geographical state in which people live quite far from major centers sometimes, and so there's a travel, and so if you delay in coming and seeking medical attention because you're not sure of your symptoms, and then it takes you a few hours to get somewhere that perhaps that medical therapy can be provided, now you're outside the window. And so what could have been perhaps more easily treated, in a large metropolitan area, that, you know, that's, not a, that's not nearly the challenge that we face here in South exactly. Dakota. So this, this is a huge thing because it, it, many of these people are way past the three-hour window. And you can't even treat them with a thrombolytic. Right. So that's, that's different. Well, let's jump into some questions. Uh, we have an uh, 87-year-old woman, 87, uh, wants to know what do the doctors think about opening a blocked coronary artery? And that, that means that you, you put a catheter up there, you blow up a balloon that opens up the artery and then puts a stent in. Mike? Well, I don't want to make the question more complicated than it is, but um, using the term blocked, um, we, we define um, blockage by the degree of narrowing, we'll call it a stenosis, or if it's totally blocked. Now, for many years, if the artery was still open, even if it was, only, if it was severely blocked, we can open it with a balloon or a stent. And so it works very well. It it's often alleviates symptoms and improves um, uh, chest pain and shortness of breath. And, and, and in fact, you can even abort a heart attack from occurring by opening it, it if you enough. catch it early enough. When it's blocked entirely and then perhaps fills via sort of some natural bypasses, sometimes those are patients that we treat medically. Now, there's a group of those patients that um, that actually still have angina, they still have chest pain, and they would benefit. So there are some new techniques, and one of our colleagues, Dr. Halligan, has actually been doing chronic total occlusions. So he's opening up, opening up some of these blockages that, that have been closed for a long time, and he has some very unique techniques where he can come both forward and kind of reverse through that area to open it. So that's a... If, if they have symptoms. If they have symptoms, that's right. There it is. Though. Yep. If it's blocked, I mean, it's sort of like my mother had one carotid artery completely blocked. And I think I even threw the case at you and you said it'd be great to help her, but it won't make any difference because it's blocked and she's already collateralized. There, it won't make any difference. And that kind of points that on. Uh, how about an 87-year-old woman uh, who says she has atrial fibrillation or fibrillation, that means the heart is irregularly irregular and is at risk for a clot from the heart. And I'm on blood pressure medicines and warfarin and metoprolol. I still have a racing heartbeat. Is that normal? And that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. The answer is you can slow that heart rate down with a little cardiozem. Yeah. So, you know, atrial fibrillation is very common. And as people get older, we are seeing more and more of it. It is, it does, is a risk factor for stroke because clots can form in the upper chamber of the heart. And so blood thinner is important. Um, the... You generally, um, you're not damaging your heart even though you're in atrial fibrillation if you control the heart rate. So medications like Toprol or Cardizam, or there's a variety of different medications that can be used to slow the heart. And if her heart rate is still racing, she should be on those medicines. A little bit more medicine. There are some newer techniques now too for people who 
can't tolerate um, a blood thinner, and there are these uh, new devices, atrial appendage devices, and some. So there's some new technology that's out there. It's not widely available, but it's coming. That in you know an 87 year old, um, you worry about blood thinner too, just because of the risk of falls. Falling. Yeah. So I mean, there's a balance. There are people at a certain age when they've had one fall, even though they have atrial fib, and they've been on warfarin. I've taken the atrial the warfarin away. Right. Uh, you think that the newer agents that are like warfarin are any better than there, warfarin? Well, there, there is some data now for um, some of the um, um, new oral anticoagulants uh, that are being out there. We see them advertised on TV, They're of really course. Pushed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, in fact, um, some of them do have a lower ble bleeding risk. Um, and um, uh, very honestly, one of the problems is that some of them are fairly expensive. And so, um, so for some of our patients, it's a it's, uh, it's more difficult. Yeah, uh, Unicom. Yeah, I mean they do. I think the the most people respond to those medications in this in a similar manner, so that they'll get a more level uh, thinning of their blood. Whereas Coumadin, they'll have to adjust dosing, and it'll kind of go up and down. And so it is more convenient uh, for the patient. And I think the bleeding risk is, is maybe a little bit lower because you get a you don't over anticoagulate patients. Uh, but the disadvantage, and what I always inform my patients about, is that the real hard thing with those is there's not a, a reversal agent for most of them. So okay. most of the patients will come in if they do have some sort of trauma or a fall. With Coumadin, it's easy to reverse and uh, thicken their blood, whereas the newer agents, it's, it's, not, it's not that easy. There's one that, is, that has a reversible, but uh, my sense is that there's no more dangerous drug than warfarin or all these others. And there's only one drug that I have out there that I can monitor that they're taking it, and that I can watch it what, how well they're responding. Mm -hmm. So it's I can I can do that with warfarin, and it's four times cheaper even if you count the monitoring. So compliance, they say, is 60 percent at best with all takers across the board and taking their medicines. I, I, that's why I'm a warfarin guy. But there are times when those other medicines are right. right. Uh, Woodman from Sioux Falls asks, how many stents can you have? <laughs> Not enough, said the cardiovascular <laughs> surgeon. Uh, I guess that's, I guess it depends on her, where, where her disease is at and what, what vessels are blocked. It's I guess all there's depends. No, yeah, there's no limit on the number of stents a, a patient can have. Um, but I will say that if, you're, if there's a patient that you've had the same vessel that's occluded multiple times and you keep doing interventions and interventions that the more you do the less likely it's going to be a long-term fix and at that time uh, stent may not be the best procedure. Right, right. I would agree with that. Life, lifestyle changes are the most important thing we can do to prevent heart disease. Let's talk about that. Well, you know, the um, you're absolutely right and uh, I think um, one of the things that um, you know, aerobic exercise is probably the most important. It has been shown to prolong survival. It's, people have better quality of life and it significantly reduces their cardiovascular or cardiac mortality and morbidity. So just walking, biking, swimming, aerobic exercise really, and, and that's been well shown in studies prospectively looking at large populations. So, you know, getting out there and walking is, is a, really a critical issue and for, for many of us it's something that's hard to work into our daily routines. Um, and it's cheap; doesn't cost anything. You well, know? So, far, no uh, pharmaceutical so, uh, industry is going to pay any money. <laughs> so, and, it can, and it doesn't have to be overly strenuous either. I mean, they've shown just even 30 minutes, three days a week, makes a significant difference. Right. I mean, so, so it's not. And it, you know, it helps with weight and and certainly uh, lipid Mood. management, cholesterol, Mood. all those things, right? So, so, <laughs> Everything. So, yeah. The, yeah, there are certainly medications that have had a dramatic impact. Um, um, antiplatelet therapy, meaning aspirin, and now some of the newer agents. Um, uh, that we use. Um, the cholesterol lowering medications, again, it's been um, the, the, what we call the statin medicines, which is a host of medicines that work by reducing your cholesterol, really have, um, they have dramatic effect. They not only reduce your cholesterol, they probably, they probably stabilize some of the unstable elements in the inside of the blood vessel, therefore making them less vulnerable to, to rupture or having a sudden blockage, uh, both in the heart and in the brain. Um, so uh, it's how about sleep apnea? Well, sleep apnea is now recognized as an as an important component or contributor to cardiovascular disease. And you know, for years we didn't really understand it. We didn't pay much attention to it. We now know that when you 
have an aptic episode and you don't breathe and your oxygen saturation drops at night, so you're not getting enough blood flow or uh, oxygen to your brain and other parts, that it is detrimental. And to say nothing of the fact that, you know, you fall asleep in your soup at, at lunch, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but no, it's really, that is a, that's newly recognized, I think, that that's a contributor. And so we're being much more aggressive about testing for it. Treatments now are much better. CPAP machines are smaller. Easier fit to better, use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, they, they, you know, it's yeah. huge, yeah. huge thing. We'll, we'll see a lot of patients even with lower extremity edema. Or sometimes you wouldn't think that would be a to sleep apnea that improve with treatment of their sleep right. apnea. Well, in atrial fib, we're talking about yeah. that irregular rhythm. One of the most common causes for atrial fib is we've discovered is sleep apnea. It just not received the press, right. um, and and so that's what we need to do. Well, and we're going to talk about one other uh, uh, lifestyle change. One key to maintaining a healthy heart is to maintain a healthy diet. Think about the food you eat. A heart healthy diet has three main focuses, fiber, fat, and sodium. Increase the fiber in your diet by increasing your intakes of fruits and vegetables. Choose fresh for the most fiber and choose canned, frozen, and cooked when fresh isn't available or in season. Also, make sure your grains are whole. Look for the phrase whole wheat or whole grain on the ingredients when choosing a bread, pasta, cracker, or any other type of grain. Reduce the fat in your diet and select the right fats to help reduce your cholesterol and improve your heart health. Focus on the good fats such as omega-3s, monounsaturateds, and polyunsaturateds. These would be found in fish, flaxseed, nuts, avocados, and oils such as canola, flax, olive, and peanut oils. Reduce your intakes of saturated and trans fats. These would be found in animal-based products such as bacon, butter, cream, lard, shortening, and coconut, along with some prepackaged foods. Finally, work to reduce the sodium in your diet. Excess sodium intake can affect your blood pressure and possibly make you retain extra fluid. Work towards a goal of one teaspoon of salt per day, which would equal 2,400 milligrams. Use less salt at the table and look at the sodium content on food labels. Try to cook with more fresh foods instead of processed. Well, as we were talking about lifestyle changes, we really haven't said much about smoking. Dustin. Yeah, I think that the, the biggest lifestyle modification that a patient with peripheral arterial disease or coronary disease can make is, is smoking cessation. Um, the, both the progression of their disease, uh, as well as the, you know, the, the durability or the, how long any intervention that is done will depend on them quitting smoking. And so, um, <clears throat> the, especially with peripheral artery disease or blockage in the legs, uh, patients that come in with claudication and quit smoking have a significantly decreased uh, risk of mortality as well as amputation. Death rate or losing the legs. Yes, yes. And so. if, if you really look at, the, at all the things, you know, we talk about, you know, high blood pressure and diabetes and, and uh, abnormal cholesterol. Actually, smoking cessation is worth three of those others. So if you're going to do something, I mean, if you're going to, the bang for your buck is to stop it's smoking. Stop smoking. I mean, yeah. it's huge. I mean, you guys see those vessels. I mean, uh, the question about whether they've been smoking or not is, is almost obvious. There, when there, are, there are, you know, we see particularly um, um, in our w women patients, and one of the things epidemiologically, that, epidemiologically that's been disappointing is the fact that so many young women are still smoking, and we've really not made a huge impact. We have younger women who come with severe peripheral arterial disease that if they hadn't smoked, they wouldn't have it. I mean, they just wouldn't have they it. They wouldn't have yeah. it. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. My mom smoked. I, I did as much as I could to tr try to get her to smoke, to, to quit smoking, and I, I, I failed. Mm -hmm. and I, she, because it's, it's a tough habit. It is a tough yeah. habit. And I mean, you know, I have to say, it's not, I, the way I look at it with uh, the, the people that I've cared, through, cared for through the years, the ones that were smokers were no nicer or meaner than the people who were not the smokers. I mean, it's not a moral issue. I mean, they're good people who smoke and they're, 
mean people that don't. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't have anything to do with that. It's just, and some of them, I think, may have a depression that's treated somewhat by it. But who knows why people cannot quit? But it's an important, yeah. important thing. It's it's very addictive, very difficult to quit. Um, and you know, some patients will, when you see them, you'll. You know, tell them they need to quit smoking. They'll talk about their parent that smoked their whole life, or somebody they know that smoked and didn't have problems. But unfortunately, we don't know how people respond to it. And there are some people, less common than 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 not, more common than not, or less common than they, they should than normal, is that you know that do smoke and don't have problems. But majority of people will, will develop difficulty problems. And like Dr. Backrack said, um, you know, when we see these young women with peripheral disease, it's pretty much from if they were not smoking, they they would not be in that in that. Right. And, and you know we have we have the South Dakota Quits Line. We have we have um, basically resources for everyone. Whether they and many of them are in fact free of charge. So it, it really is incumbent upon the individual to say, you know, I can't do this anymore. I have to stop. What about um, non-smoke tobacco products? I mean, I, I, my personal bias is way better than smoking, but still, there's problematic. Uh, what's your take on it? So you're talking about these blue cigarette type things? Or the, yeah, the, the, you know, um, and the, the, I don't know what they're, they're, they're little yeah. aerosolized right. things. I, you know, the, at this point, I'm not aware of any specific data that suggests that they're safe, okay? There hasn't been enough longitudinal studies to say that, that they're dangerous or that they contribute to vascular or lung disease the way we know cigarettes do. But I think that there's um, these, um, there's still concern, and I know, um, at the NIH level, there's still significant warnings about, you know, National where, Institutes right, of Health where, they, where these, and again, it's one of these things that many of these young people are, are using them as, yeah. a, as opposed to regular cigarettes. Right. And so we may not know for a number of years now whether there's really significant detrimental effects from right. them. Right. Fifty-nine-year-old man from Yankton, and we need to talk about abdominal aortic aneurysm because Let's do that. Uh, that's the biggest factor, uh, risk factor for smoking, isn't it? Uh, I mean, they, the, the national recommendation for ultrasound of the abdominal aorta uh, as a screening tool is for men who have smoked. Uh, is that what? Yes, yeah, smoking and family history are the two hi highest risk for, for abdominal, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Yes, yes, that is true. And so we recommend that if you're a male over 65 and a smoker, you should have a, at least one screening ultrasound of your aorta look for um, aneurysms and the Society of Vascular Surgery also recommends actually females at 65 that are smokers as well and or family history um, and then if you've had a family history in your male usually we screen those patients at 55 and the screen is important because most patients will not know they have an aneurysm until it's enlarged to the point where it ruptures or it's causing significant problems so it's a it really is a disease that screen is important because if you find it it's very treatable but if it's something that is not found uh, before it does rupture then it's you know a very uh, very high mortality. Yeah. Once they break, the the chance that you'll uh, that we can save you is is very low, uh, uh, not zero, but um, but it's very low. I have a dear friend, I, and who who whose name was very similar to your name, mm. who was a, a patient of mine, leaned on me, smoker, you know, had finally quit, came in one day to the emergency room. Severe pain. We got him to Sioux Falls. You guys into the abdominal surgery and lost him on the table. And I just, I mean, I think about that guy. Every time I think of an abdominal aortic aneurysm, if I'd only screened him, if I'd only uh, done what I could to help him. Well, you know, that's the both the vascular society, surgical side as well as the vascular medicine side nationally have advocated a more aggressive screening for that very reason. Because many patients, especially if they're well nourished, it's it's hard to feel an aneurysm when you well go on exam. Well nourished, their be belly and is their big belly, that's right. <laughs> but but in fact, again, it, they're insidious. So many people have them and are unaware that they have them. So and do you recommend those um, screening ultrasounds of the abdominal aorta that are moving from town to town and sometimes are at churches? And yeah, so. typically not, um, although I would tell you that if there's it's important to know your family history if if you can. You know, what did your grandfather die from? What did your uncles die from? Where did they have is there aneurysmal disease in your in your family? And and a realistic assess, assessment of your risk factors, do you have high cholesterol? Have you been a smoker? Have you have high high blood pressure? Right. Th those are things that you know, I, I think that uh, And they ask those questions at those that those fairs. Right. And you know, that if you can pick 
one test, I've ten, I tell them, well, I don't believe in the carotid surgeries, I mean, carotid ultrasound thing and the peripheral leg ultrasound. But maybe just if you can pick one and it's 50 bucks, why not do the abdominal aorta? Yeah. Yeah, although, although I, the, actually the ABI, the ankle brachial index, that they, is actually correlates with the yeah. presence of coronary disease. So, and that can be done with just a blood pressure cuff. Um, so, uh, I would tell you that that's actually that was the test. That's the test I'd go for just because it's, it's the most cost effective, I wow. think. Um, and it's not operator dependent. I mean, it's very easy to do. That's very but interesting. It, but, um, so, I mean, the fact that there's peripheral disease in the legs says that there's coronary disease is an important well, point again. You know, I, I, tell, that one I tell patients all the time, you know, if, if you have, you know, and I grew up in an area where there was lots of um, iron and calcium in the water so that the pipes would get plugged up. Yeah. And I tell them, I said, well, if you have that, it doesn't just get plugged up in the kitchen or just in the bathroom, right? It, it goes through the whole house. <laughs> yeah. Now, there's certain areas where it's more likely, you know, at the, at the you know, the under the sink, that kind of thing. Yeah. But the fact is it's a systemic disease. It's a disease that it potentially affects all of the arteries. And, and that's what you have to emphasize, the recognizing that that you have to address, if they have an aneurysm, you need to address their heart. If they have peripheral vascular disease, you need to address their heart and their carotid arteries. You need to look at the whole, uh, recognizing that the disease process involves all of the potential arteries. That's and, right. And, well, the next question is about diabetes. How big of a risk factor is diabetes for vascular disease? Well, it is it's a significant uh, risk factor. I mean, it's a, when, we, when we see patients with peripheral artery disease or coronary disease, uh, for you know, with lifestyle modification, another thing is is if they are diabetic, to make sure their blood sugars is as controlled as as, as well, well as, as possible. Yeah. Right. The, the other thing that that I, that I would just add to the diabetes, they they could, they're at increased risk for limb loss compared to non-diabetics. Right. And part of that isn't always just the blockage; it's the fact that they they don't have good feeling in their feet. Um, that they it injure their feeling. foot and they get a sore and then it gets infected. Well, and they're walking on a pebble, they don't exactly. know there's something exactly. going on. So, so easy things, good shoes, looking at your feet on a daily basis. Um, go, if you have trouble with your nails, going to a podiatrist. You know, just good nail care, good, you know, good hygiene things. They make the difference between keeping your legs sometimes. I, I, I really like to encourage people to wash their feet. I mean, you know, it's way down there, you know, and you, I've washed my hair and I've washed everything else. Get down, you know, get a shower chair and get down and clean your feet and, and keep the hygiene there and it'll keep a lot of that problem because it gets cocked up and scaly and trouble. So work on keeping your feet in good, good order. It is important because patients with peripheral disease, a lot of them will have claudication or get by fine, but then once they develop a wound on their foot, they won't have enough perfusion to heal that. And then it, that is when they're at significant risk of limb loss and, yeah. and getting run into problems. Particularly diabetics, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was the question, 59-year-old from Yankton, about diabetes. How, how does that affect the heart? And how does having low blood sugar readings in the 20s affect the heart? Low sugars means you're too tight. I mean, I, I, I'm afraid of that as well. Yeah, that, you know, it's a, um, a, neither Dustin or myself are experts in diabetes, so I don't want to overstate this, but um, certainly your blood sugar needs to be in a certain range. If it's too high, it's bad. If it's too low, it's bad. So, um, you know, if you get this low, you can, you can pass out. You can, you know, uh, burn get, brain cells. Right. Very, you get very, what we call hypoglycemic to the point where you can't function normally. So um, I can't tell you that it, that it has a direct effect on the heart, although we do know that when the blood sugars are very high for long periods of time, that it's, that it's very detrimental to the, to the inner lining of the blood vessels. So we have a person asking about atrial fib and warfarin or Xeralto. We, we answered that earlier, but she said, is it normal to have ongoing dizziness with metoprolol or any of the medicines that slow the heart and also lower the blood pressure? Well, that, yeah, that's the, the, the critical information. Um, you know, is it dizziness? And, and vertigo, or is it a sense of lightheadedness? If it's lightheadedness, when does it occur? Does it occur with standing or any time? Um, the, the medication like metoprolol, which is a beta blocker medication, will blunt your normal response so that when you go from sitting to standing, normally your heart rate increases to keep the blood pressure up and blood flow to your brain because right. you're now going against gravity. Right. If, if you've blunted that response, 
now all of a sudden you get lightheaded because blood flow isn't there. So you have to be more careful about getting up suddenly. You have to do those things. If, you know, if you're dizzy all the time or lightheaded all the time, then that's an indication that something's not right, that either the medication, you're on too much medicine or there's another issue going on and you should seek medical attention. It's amazing how many of those passing out from too much metoprolol happens when they stand up to sing at church. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? 76-year-old female from Brookings had quadruple bypass six years ago, has had nine stents, has been on Coumadin but still not regulated. Her cardiologist tells her that she still can't do anything for her. He can't do anything for her anymore. She is still having pain and breathlessness and discomfort. This has been off and on for the last six years. Do you have any suggestions? Well, um, yeah, that, I mean, I'll take that. So, um, you know, um, shortness of breath and limitations with functional activities, doing the things that you normally do, daily activities, is a, is a function not only of the blockage, but basically it's really, it's predominantly the function of the heart, how well the heart's pumping. Is the heart regulated? Is there, and sometimes when there's been significant damage to the heart, there isn't much to do to improve the, the pumping function. But what you do is you can put people on medicine, you lower their blood pressures a little bit so the heart doesn't have to work so hard. Um, there are some things through exercise that can be done. Um, nowadays, there are some specialized pacemaker or rhythm management tools that can be used to try and improve the cardiac function. So, so it's that complicated. Yeah, so yeah. some of this, so there's no one thing. Um, just fixing the artery doesn't always fix okay. the problem. There you go. 68-year-old woman from Wall, what causes the enzyme troponin in your heart to elevate? Troponin is one of those great, in, I mean, you know, we used to look at LDHs and, and uh, CKs, CKs and, and all that. Now we have troponin. It's a wonderful enzyme. What's right. that so, story? Well, the troponin is released from the myocardial cells when there's damage. Okay, now there's a different couple of different kinds, but we're talking really about cardiac. Um, and it is um, an indicator that there's been some damage or that the, that the heart muscle, those cells, haven't gotten enough blood and oxygen. So it's released and we can do just a blood test and check it. And so it's one of the tools that we use to try and determine whether someone's had an acute heart attack. The difficulty with it is that assays are a little bit different. You can't always compare what you get from Westington Springs compared to what you might get in Brookings or in Sioux Falls. That's number one. Number two, there are, Five seconds. Though there are a few things that cause a problem. Renal dysfunction, a few other things that, that will give you a spurious result. So That's a difficult issue. Yeah. And now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc quiz question. When a blockage of an artery occurs, the body can repair itself by making another blood vessel to bypass the blockage. True or false? The answer is? True. True. It was Florence McDaniel who is a dear friend of ours from Brookings, who answered the question correctly. Thank you, Florence, for participating. And a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. <coughs> Sorry, flu. You're not you when you have the flu. Get vaccinated, because stopping the flu starts with you. George is a middle-aged friend who is physically active, non-smoking, relatively thin, non-stressed, has low cholesterol, and last month had his third heart attack. Why is he stricken with this condition? What causes blocked blood vessels or atherosclerosis? And how can George, or any of us, prevent atherosclerosis and the resulting heart attacks, strokes, or leg amputations? Pathologists have found on the autopsies of young soldiers who've died in war that early atherosclerosis is occurring in disturbingly high numbers. Aside from genetic influences, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute lists the main causes for atherosclerosis as smoking, high amounts of certain fats and cholesterol in the blood, high blood pressure, and high amounts of sugar in the blood. 
The Institute states that the most important step to prevent vascular disease should be with lifestyle changes. If you smoke, quit. Eat a moderate balanced diet with enough fruits and vegetables. Exercise regularly. And periodically monitor your blood pressure and blood sugar. George has been doing all that. Scientists in the pharmaceutical industry would have long sought a simple pill to prevent vascular disease, and pills to control blood pressure and blood sugar have helped. Although high cholesterol levels are a risk factor, unfortunately statins and lipid-lowering medicines have proven only meager benefit in our fight against atherosclerosis. George has controlled his blood pressure, his blood sugar, and been taking a statin pill from the beginning. A malicious, less known, and yet treatable risk factor for vascular disease is sleep apnea. The consequences of prolonged periods of low oxygen caused by smoking or sleep apnea is atherosclerosis. In a 13-year Australian study of 30 to 65-year-old people, five times as many people who had moderate to severe sleep apnea, 33%, died compared to those who slept well at night, 6%. The difference mostly from vascular disease. Now we can treat sleep apnea with continuous positive airway pressure, also called CPAP, where a nose or a face mask air pressure device prevents oxygen levels from dropping harmfully low during sleep. Recent studies indicate that the use of CPAP brings a significant reduction in death rate. Another way to treat severe sleep apnea is weight loss, but accomplishing significant permanent weight loss remains a very daunting task. I advise my patients that until weight loss occurs, we best treat sleep apnea with CPAP. George will be having a sleep study soon. I sincerely thank our guests tonight, Dustin Weiss and Michael Bacharach, for volunteering to come to our studio and help with our program. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Now on to our flu season update. This week, I admitted a patient in our community with influenza A, and the patient had not been traveling out of our local area. The bug is around us, wherever we are. There will be many more cases of influenza this year, but hopefully fewer than recent years. The numbers may still go very high before we're through, and the peak may be delayed to March or even April, but it will get there. Don't delay, get your flu shot, now reduce your chances of catching the flu bug. That does it for tonight from all of us here on On Call with the Prairie Doc. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How do you avoid daily dangers in your home? How about preventing different cancers? Or is it too late to get a flu shot? It is Ask Anything, next time, on call with The Prairie Doc. Hello and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc After Hours. We had many great questions submitted beyond what we could answer during the broadcast portion of our show. So let's get started. 79-year-old woman from Sioux Center, Iowa. I can only walk about 300 feet without feeling very faint and my legs hurting terribly. I've had an echo and an EKG. Both came back normal. Could it be related to the circulation in the legs? Yes, I think um, she may have a blockage in the blood vessels down to her, down her legs, and when she walks, she's not getting enough blood flow, and that's causing the pain. Both the echo or the EKG wouldn't, wouldn't show sure. that. So the test she would need was a, an ankle brachial index, where they check the blood pressure in her arm and then the leg, and that would help determine whether she does have blockages that's causing her pain. Pretty simple test should be done everywhere, right? Yeah, yes, it can yes. be done easily in the, in the outpatient office setting. 
Right. My husband had four bypasses eight weeks ago. His surgery involved moving a vessel in the chest to form one bypass. He's had phantom pain in his chest and back. Please talk about phantom pain. How long does it last? So he had an internal mammary artery, right, from right. inside. That's the best kind to have. Lucky, lucky that he had that. Right. But he's got this phantom pain or what? Well, uh, you know, I think that it's, it's probably not truly phantom pain. It's real pain from the inflammation and the fact that you have to pull that artery away from the chest wall to mobilize it so it can be attached to the blood vessel. And that just takes time. So discomfort, uh, you know, even six weeks after the procedure is not uncommon. Okay. Um, a uh, 74 year old woman, a uh, man from Warner, pain in the carotid artery in the neck. Is that indicative of a problem or is it something unusual? So he feels pain in his neck. What do you think, Dustin? Usually it's not a symptom of carotid atherosclerosis, but the, I mean, some pain, you can get severe neck pain with a carotid dissection. Um, uh, more likely it's arthritis or joint. Most likely it's not, no. It, most likely it's not his carotid artery, but it, he may benefit from an ultrasound. Wouldn't there, hurt. Yeah, there's a concept called carotidinia, which is the fancy name we have for that pain. type of discomfort that we really don't understand. It, can, it, it, it may be the outside covering, it may be some infl inflammation, it may be some other things, but, but generally when you have blockage, it doesn't cause pain. No. Boy, I, I've had a jillion patients who've had neck pain of a variety of kinds. And almost always, it's not carotid pain. I mean, it's yeah. neck, it's bones, it's muscles, it's uh, lymph nodes. There's a variety of things. Get a good exam is what I would suggest. 80-year-old uh, man, woman from Pierre, talk a little bit more about the risks of taking a baby aspirin a day for the heart. Well, so we used to think that everybody should be on aspirin, certainly everybody over age 50, based on the physician health study that was done for the Framingham work and so on. The, we now know that if you have heart disease, baby aspirin is good for you. If you don't have heart disease, it may still be good for you, but the data is not quite as supportive. It's a push, isn't it? Right, so I think that the, the issue there is, um, are there risks associated? Well, there's a, a small risk of, of gastric upset, of, of stomach upset, or of bleeding from a stomach, uh, ulcer, or um, so, but with a baby aspirin, that risk is really very low, and so, um, uh, but I would throw in that it also helps prevent polyps and uh, colon cancer. And so in my mind, uh, certainly a good indicator for a baby aspirin a day is colon polyps or a family history for colon cancer. So, I mean, it's a balance. Right. It's so, not as, as sure as we used to think. Used, that's right. But it's still, the, the overall risk from taking a baby aspirin is really very low. 68-year-old male from Sioux Falls, I've heard of a procedure in which they reduce the size of the ventricles to increase the ejection fraction, thereby improving congestive heart failure. Do you do that procedure in Sioux Falls? So I'm not aware yeah. of that yeah. procedure. So, so um, that, that is done. Now, typically, that's done to reduce. Um, what happens when the, when the heart muscle gets damaged, you can form a aneurysm or an outpouching of the, of the of the, and so if, if you, for example, if this area here gets damaged, the, the, you'll often develop kind of a bulge like this, and that area then doesn't contract very well. Right. And so as a result, you can actually, you can remove that and then sew it up and take that portion of the non-functioning valve or of heart muscle, and you can take that and, and Yes, it's done not commonly. It's, it's certainly been done in, in Sioux Falls. Um, uh, there are a number of heart surgeons do it. Um, again, it's, it, it's a, it's a it's, rare, it's, it's a relatively- It's got to be just the right, right situation. Right. It's a it? relatively uncommon situation and one where um, uh, I would tell you that it's, it's not a sort of an easy fix. It's something right. that can be done in certain circumstances. Um, Right, um, not an outpatient procedure, that's for no, sure. No, it's a big operation. So clearly. here's the other one, though, is that when you have a thick septum, some people will have a, a normal ventricle wall like this. I mean, here it is. But this septum is really thick. And so they have uh, a, my, a cardiomyopathy that right. blocks the flow uh, out the aortic valve. Right. Uh, and so they've done procedures where they've cut part of that right. out. What do you think of that? Well, myomectomy's done, and again, it's generally done in conjunction with other procedures usually. Um, um, 
the like coronary bypass, the right, or other when you're in there doing something, you know, or a valve, for example. Um, there are also there are also some non-surgical techniques called um, uh, septal ablation using alkyl ablation to reduce that. Oh. There's there's some new rhythm management techniques where they can synchronize the heart in a different way with a pacer that will that. But, but if you truly have a big thickened area, uh, myomectomy that's the fancy name for that can be done. Muscle um, removal. Right. Surgery. That's right. So. Um, a uh, 64-year-old woman was rap from Rapid went to mention wanted to mention that her daughter that was on birth control had TIAs and they should mention that they can occur in patients that are young as well. TIAs from birth control pills absolutely a, a significant uh, problem. Well, the, well the, the oral contraceptives can influence the blood clotting mechanisms, and so it can make you more likely to form a clot if that clot. You know, goes to the brain. Yes, it can cause a stroke or a TIA. More commonly, it's associated with blockage in the veins because the not veins clots in their legs. Right, because the veins, the blood tends to pool there and sits not under as much flow, and so as a result, you're, you're, there's a greater tendency to form a clot there. Yeah. So I would tell you that 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 yes, oral contraceptives are a risk factor based on the clotting issues. More commonly deep vein thrombosis right. rather than TIA, but certainly TIAs would be, could, and, could and happen. It, and it uncovers uh, a clotting abnormality right. this woman right. probably right. has that right. she inherited and from her mother. And it's, it's actually particularly bad in a smoker. So if you're a woman smoker and you're on oral contraceptives, that inc significantly increases your risk of having a clot problem. In, in fact, you should never be on the both. I mean, that's just, you know, you shouldn't be a smoker and on birth control pills. Uh, that's easy to see. 87 year old man from T does vitamin C help with heart attack prevention? Have you heard that? Either one of you? No, I'm not aware of any data that suggests that that's a benefit. Uh, the question about this person who, if she was smoking and was on birth control pills, if she quit smoking and she, and she stopped birth control pills, would their veins get better? Would her body be better? Um, it depends. I mean, if she has, if you develop a blood clot in your in your leg, then you are at significant uh, risk of having prolonged yeah. swelling and a, what, what's called a post-thrombotic syndrome. That depends on how significant the clot is. Um, and because of that, we do do interventions on, on blood clots now. So if a patient has an occlusive clot at the groin vein or, or a clot above the groin, then we will do lysis in, in hopes of preventing them from getting what's called a post-thrombotic syndrome, which is swelling, edema, and they can actually develop ulcers from that. Yeah. So, and, but definitely, if a person's smoking and having vascular problems, uh, does the whole thing reverse when they quit smoking sometimes? Well, the truth is probably not. It doesn't reverse everything. <clears throat> Excuse me, does it help? Yes, it helps, so. Yeah, all right. Uh, we have an 85-year-old woman from Aberdeen, blood pressure 141 over 97, a pulse of 143 by mid-afternoon. Her heart rate went down to 89. Blood pressure stayed the same. She has a lot of flushing as well. Is this much fluctuation enough to go to the emergency room? Um, I'm not happy about the 143. Yeah, me either. So something's not right here. So to have this much variation or range in heart rate is not normal and she needs to go and see her yeah. family doctor or internist this is not the this is not ex an acceptable yeah. heart rate she needs a holter monitor cuz she's having right, episodes of atrial fib right <laughs> what's happening that's right that's yeah. Yeah. Um, flushing as well well i mean that's a non specific symptom isn't it 75 year old man from Sioux Falls i have a resting pulse of 45 is it too low should i be concerned you know, <clears throat> a lot of people do find it 45. Right, exactly. And certainly, the, it really depends on how you feel and what your blood pressure is. If your heart rate drops to 45 and your blood pressure is, the top number is 70 and you're lightheaded, that's a problem. Yeah. If your blood pressure is within the normal range and you feel all right, 45 is, and many of us get down into that range or even lower when we sleep. Yeah. We just don't know it because we don't monitor our yeah. heart rates. No. 70-year-old yeah. <laughs> male from Adrian, Minnesota, had four or five stents in his heart, is on Plavix, is wondering if he can get off of it or be able to take it every other day instead of daily. Good question. Yeah, that is. So, um, you know, the, it de 
number one, it depends on what type of stents that he had. Okay, if he had these special medicated stents that are what Have we call drug coated, right? Then um, the risk of having a, a having them plug up or thrombose is significant, and they and he should stay on the Plavix for a minimum of a year. Um, Plavix has been shown to to provide about a 10% incremental benefit over aspirin alone for cardiovascular events. So even if you don't have stents, um, if you're going to take it, you probably should take it on a daily basis. Um, Plavix is now generic. It's called clopidogrel. That's the generic term. It's uh, relatively inexpensive. And unless you're having some untoward bleeding issues, I would tell you that you Stay basically on. should take it every day. <laughs> right. You agree? I, I do agree. Stay that. on it. Yes. It's cheap. If you just go to clopidogrel, it's, you know, it's not very expensive. At least a baby aspirin, but I would stay on the Plavix. 76-year-old yeah. woman from Sioux Falls, woman has headaches, has been on Excedrin. Recently, two dark veins have appeared in her left temple. Should she be concerned? I would start with Excedrin has a kind of a combined medication in it that can bring headaches on, particularly with withdrawal headaches, and a regular dosing of Excedrin might be the reason why you're having headaches. Now, do you have any comments about dark veins on the left temple? Dustin. Uh, I guess it, it's kind of difficult to tell. I mean, I, 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 I guess the significance of that, I'm, I'm not sure. I wouldn't yeah, think it's a significant finding. No, but, yeah, I, I, don't take Excedrin. Get, get off of, actually, Tylenol will give you rebound headaches. Why don't you just get off of pills, give it two weeks, and see, you know, keep your baby aspirin on board, I mean, you know, um, uh, personally. But uh, I, I would say get, get off pills yeah. and see what happens. Woman from Sioux Falls, does atrial fibrillation uh, damage the heart? Atrial fibrillation in and of itself does not damage the heart. The clinical events that atrial fibrillation results in, for example, a very fast heart rate, can over time be detrimental. And if you form clots in the upper chamber of the heart because it's not beating rhythmically, they can be pushed out and cause a stroke or what we call an embolic event and plug up an artery somewhere else. So if you control the heart rate and you're not having clot formation, the atrial fibrillation in itself doesn't damage the heart. Good answer. 85-year-old female from Lenox. I have atrial fib. I'm on warfarin. I have fluid retention. What are your explanations for this? And there's more going on than just atrial fib. It might be that there's a little heart weakness from one other reason, coronary disease or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the fluid retention. But there are other reasons for fluid retention. Right. Or, or um, some people, um, particularly um, if she has hypertensive heart disease, um, the loss of her normal atrial filling pressure will actually put her into some degree of heart failure. And so she will retain more fluid. So she's someone who needs to check with her doctor to see whether she could be back in sinus rhythm because having that upper chamber contract in a rhythmic fashion to help fill the bottom chamber may be enough to, to improve that. And that's particularly true in patients who have a, kind of a thick, stiff heart Some muscle. Diastolic that, failure. Right, that has diastolic dysfunction. A Usually diuretic from, too could help. Sure, yep. All right, quick, I've got the, my, my producer says, you've got a lot more questions, be quick. Okay. Female from Minnesota, I've had lots of heart problems. My heart is hardening, like we just talked about. Two valves are leaking. What treatments are there for this? And uh, Dustin? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't manage uh, valvular heart disease, um, but it obviously depends on uh, how, how, how stenotic or how narrow the, the valves are. I mean, yeah, and I mean, basically, we, we need a little more information. Yeah. Um, that nowadays, we can replace valves. We even we need now even have catheter-based valve replacement techniques, but we need to know what valve is problematic, which one's not working, right. and yeah. echo will help right. a lot. Ninety-three-year-old male from Sioux Falls noticed this morning a big bruise from below elbow toward shoulder, about six to seven inches long, around the arm. He isn't on blood thinners. Is it serious? Well. well um, <laughs> Again, the, the problem is as we get older, all of our blood vessels are a little more fragile. Our skin is more fragile. So even a small bumper bruise can result in a fairly large, um, what we call a hematoma, or collection of blood under the skin. So, I mean, the best thing to do is to have this looked at. 
Is it causing mobility issues? Is it causing pain? Is it spreading? Is it you know enlarging? Right. Those are the kinds of things. But I would seek medical attention, at least have someone look at it. Right. But likely, it's just one of those 93-year-old bruise easy, right. not a dangerous thing. 44-year-old female from Sioux Falls, I have a PFO, uh, patent foramen ovale, with an atrial aneurysm treated with right to left shut at rest. I do not have pulmonary hypertension. Can this be fixed? Yes, and in fact, I'm one of the people who does that procedure, so I can comment about that. Um, a PFO is a, collect, is a, a little connection between the two, two upper chambers of the heart. So blood flow can, can go across, and often the septum becomes redundant. When they say aneurysmal, it's really redundant. It's like a sail flapping back and forth. So clots can form across that. We now have a number of devices that, that, that you can go up through the vein, go across, seal it off, and solve the problem, and, solve the problem. and it's, a, it's basically a, a, a 30 minute procedure nowadays. And it would prevent the pulmonary hypertension that might occur with too much blood. Right. Typically though with a PFO, um, the likelihood that she's going to have pulmonary hypertension is relatively low. The predominant reason to treat this really would be for stroke prevention, um, not so much for shunt. So you okay. you'd need a little bit more information right. to determine whether she needs to have this fixed or not. If the pressures uh, move the clot uh, are moving from well if she has a say she has a, a deep vein thrombosis and the, and the clot goes from the right to the left it can suddenly go to the brain and cause right. a stroke so there you go 63 year old woman with this history obese major fatigue shortness of breath with every little exercise I do experience air hunger at least a couple times a week sleep apnea and wearing CPAP nightly high blood pressure on three meds unfit Questions, on occasion I experience an odd feeling usually when I step outside uh, of a building, like I can feel my heart beat and blood pressure behind my ear and the back of the head. Thought it was something to do with the building pressure from outside or in, uh, but not always outside, and others don't experience this. Is it due to high blood pressure or something else? Could it be carotid disease? So she can feel the pressures behind her ear. Well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that, that her blood pressure is not well controlled and that with exercise her blood pressure is going up and she has a greater sensation for that. Um, it may also be that she's very deconditioned and as a result her heart has to work very hard and so she feels the pounding of her heart and that sensation is transmitted right. up into the, into the head, into the carotid arteries. So this would not be a primary uh, indicator that she has carotid disease, but certainly um, you know, this is someone who would benefit from aerobic exercise, weight loss. Start and, slow and get right, going and yep. work on that. I would say it has nothing to do with the pressures inside or outside the building, though. It has yeah, something to do with exactly that. Right, I'd agree with that. What would cause my lower right, this is the last question. Okay. What could cause my lower right back to hurt and pound like heavy heartbeat when I do some exercise like walking upstairs, regular walking? Lower right back, Dustin? No, yeah, sure, I mean, the Walking upstairs or the exercising, you know, usually wouldn't get lower back pain. Usually exercising from blood vessels, the pain you get from blood vessel disease is the muscle you're actually using. In your lower back, you're not using it. So you could get buttock, if she's actually having buttock or hip pain, um, that could definitely be from a blockage artery. Lower back pain with ambulation, it's probably more of a musculoskeletal problem. I, I totally agree. Well, I have to tell you, thank you both very much for your time, your expertise, your volunteer support of our program and the help of uh, the individuals that are calling in and watching our show. Thank you, both of you, very thank much. You. And thank you for joining us on our website. We appreciate all of your questions and the opportunity to answer them. And until next time, from all of us at On Call with the Prairie Doc, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. 
and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, an organization working with the state's health care community to improve quality of care as part of the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. Additional funding is provided by Aberdeen Asthma and Allergy, Avera Heart Hospital, Brookings Health System, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Dakota Care, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, South Dakota State Medical Association, Swift Health Communications, and Vance Thompson Vision. Closed captioning for On Call with the Prairie Doc is provided by Avera, Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.